I don't know how to start this. I think that we're gonna disagree a lot. You're just start, you're just going. You're yep. just starting off with That's, some opinions. Yep. Hello, Hello, it's me, it's Jacob. I never say my name when I start these videos. How do you guys know who I am? I've done this for five years. You know we've been doing this for five years? Really? Five years and I don't know how to start or end videos. <clears throat> Stop being weird. Mm. Okay, okay, just, okay. Just do it. Okay, just, hi. We're gonna do the thing that we did a little while ago where we're gonna look over all the adventures that have come out for Dungeons and Dragons the fifth edition since uh, forever. And we're gonna tell you which ones we like mm -hmm. and which ones we don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm Jacob and this is pregnant wife, Spencer. I, I made like a little like paper. Me too. Uh, to, oh, you made oh, yours double-sided. You, You're you smart. Wait, you also made a paper of like, of like notes? Yeah. Uh, I was just trying to be smart. I didn't know you'd just copy me. I I didn't copy you. Well, I, your, your notes are in Times New Roman. No, and they're not. In they're not in Times New Roman. Mine's in Cillian Rail. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> Let's see Paula Allen's <laughs> <laughs> D&D Adventure List. Ah, uh, stop it. So that's what we're doing today, yep. is we're gonna go through, we're gonna rank them, and we're gonna tell you what we think, and you don't have to give a uh, crap about what we say about these. No. Um, but this is just our opinion. Maybe Where? you're thinking about, you're running a D&D for the Digital Adventure, and you, you wanna know which, which is the best. Well, w these are just our opinions, yeah. and we're gonna kinda tell you our feelings about Everything that we've played in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we do that, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Fables. Guys, Fables is a subscription service run by Ghostfire Gaming. Every month they upload a few adventures. Uh, the current one I think is Citadel of the Unseen Sun. It's very cool, it's got vampires. It's got uh, Grim Hollow-esque stuff because those are the guys who wrote Grim Hollow. So uh, if you want to go subscribe to it and get some cool adventures that you can get every month, there's a link down in the description. We're starting in chronological order with all the D&D adventures. The first one is Lost Minds of Fandelver. Lost Mine. Lost what? There's one. It's just one mine. They only lost one mine? They lost the one, yeah. <laughs> so as we start off with our first adventure here, I want to lay out some of the ground rules here. Um, we don't know what we're talking about. I mean, not only do we not know what we're talking about, we're going purely off of our experience. Yeah. So maybe you've had a really good time running some of the adventures that we don't like, but I'm going to try to explain to you, we're both going to try to explain to you mm -hmm. what we liked and what we didn't like about mm -hmm. them. Especially because the perspective that Spencer and I both have on these adventures are completely different. Yeah. I am uh, mostly DMing a lot of these adventures and you've played in a lot of these adventures. You'll get the perspective of like dungeon master but also uh, player, yeah. so. Have you played in any of these? Uh, yeah, I've played in a few. Okay. Um, but like not all the way through and yeah. Um, yeah. I have never completed a campaign. Uh, no, one, only one. one. Marshalls. Marshalls, right. yeah. That was it. Anyways, for the last time, lost mine. Mine. Of Fandelver. Yep. I wrote that as a dungeon master, Lost Minds of Fandelver is pretty boring. It's very uncompelling. It has no reason to do anything. Right. You sort of start off the adventure as mercenaries and then you get attacked and that's your reason to adventure is goblins di attacked you. Yeah. Figure out why and I feel like that for this being more marketed towards like newer players, it isn't like super great at at compelling them to go do the adventure. It's just like, well, don't you want to find out why these goblins did this? And honestly, a lot of players are gonna be like, I, I guess, I guess so. Like, I, I don't know, is that what I'm supposed to do? Mm -hmm. You know, this lost lost mine of Fendelver and also Dragon of Ice Bear Peak are meant to be uh, starting adventures to lead into the other Forgotten Realms books. Yeah, that makes sense. Because at least with Ice Bear Peak, I know people who've done that and have tied it into not only yeah. their campaign, but like Curse of Strahd or... Yeah. And then also in the front gives you rules to game by, which I think are all very good. That's, um, that's really good. Things for baby DMs to, to know and to learn. That's my pros actually, is that it's really simple and mm -hmm. it's really easy to run for DMs. Yes. Um, and I have to give it credit because it's, it's fine. It's okay for being like the first D&D uh, adventure that they made really simple for new DMs to possibly run. So I, I guess that's its saving grace, but in my opinion, there are just better adventures. Like th yeah. this is fine because they did it first and it's simple and it's good. It does what it says it's going to do, but there are just better adventures that you could run. It's not super interesting yeah. in my Also, opinion. this one is incredibly accessible. It's like 20 bucks at Target. Yep. It comes and with dice, character sheets, pre-made characters. Yes, everything. So um, like that works out. Yeah. 
but the Essentials Kit is better. The Essentials Kit, in my opinion, is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But. So I give uh, Lost Mine of Fandelver a 4 out of 10. I gave it a 5 out of 10. Oh. It fell off the table. It did. Uh, next up, we've got everybody's favorite, uh, Tyranny of Dragons. This yeah. is the reprint of Tyranny of Dragons, where they put Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat into one gigantic book. Have we played it? We played this? it. One, we've, I've run it twice. Um, I haven't run it all the way through. Right. I've heard that Rise of Tiamat gets a little good towards the end, but I can't speak for it, so I'm not going to. I know this mostly by Horde of the Dragon Queen, which personally I find to be very over the top, has very little choices, little motivation, and does that thing where it just goes, hey players, go do the thing, right. and gives them no reason to care about it. It starts off with like a dragon attacking a keep, and the players need to care about a dragon attacking a keep keep, but it gives them no reason to care about a dragon dragon attacking a keep. And then they can't defeat the dragon attacking the keep, right. so they just get to watch it happen and then are told to go deal with it. It's just, it's, and the NPCs have little motivation. It has a lot of plot holes too. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just not very good. You can skip this one. I was just going to agree with you that I, what we have played, I don't remember. I'm sure if you, if you had the right group and the right DM, it'd probably be pretty fun, but I can't rank it because I, don't remember what I have played of it. And, yeah. Um, you know what the pros are? What? Tiamat cool. Yeah, Tiamat so, is two out very of cool. Two out of ten. I, I didn't give it a score because I think that's unfair. I would give it a one out of ten, but it gets a one point because Tiamat cool. Okay, the next book is Princes of the Apocalypse. Yes. I've never played or run Princes of the Apocalypse. And we don't own the book. And I don't plan on running it. Yep. So I guess go watch Davy Chappie's video or something. The next book is Out of the Abyss. Um, Which we do own, but couldn't find. I can't, I don't know where it went. I, all, think, I have all my books. It'd be really funny if it was just right here. Yeah. It's not. not. I cannot find Out of the Abyss, um, but I have run it multiple times. Yes. And uh, my cons for it are that it is complicated. It is slow. It has a huge character motivation drop off towards about the middle of the game. Um, because the whole idea of Out of the Abyss is that you are trapped in the Underdark mm -hmm. and you're trying to find your way out. That's the character motivation. And it does one of my favorite things that a lot of really good D&D adventure modules do, is it puts you in what I call a trapped scenario, where the player's motivation is solely try to escape because they're trapped in this area and they are forced to explore this area in order to try to get out. And um, I think that that works really well with some D&D adventures. And I think the, the initial motivation, the, it has a really good hook. The fact that you have to do a prison escape and then you get to explore the Underdark is very, very interesting. But by the time you get like through Grackle Stug and then to Menzo Branzen, it gets really boring. And like the motivation falls off because the players think that they would have surfaced by now. Mm -hmm. And it, by the time you surface, it's like, it becomes like a war. This book is where my love for the Underdark and demons came from, but I do agree with you. It was very complicated. There's a lot for the DM to keep track of. There's like, what, nine NPCs? The very beginning of the game, and it sucks for new DMs because yeah. the players are trapped in a prison and the game gives you like nine NPCs to mm -hmm. keep track of. And it's, it's very overwhelming. Yeah. I feel like all the NPCs are really cool, but having nine NPCs and most tables are four plus players is a lot it's to insane. keep track of. I think if we played it now, now that you have more DM experience, I think yeah. we could do it and it would be fun because you would know, okay, I can take these NPCs out or have them leave the party sooner. Yeah, and the issue is that um, like as you travel through the Underdark, mm -hmm. the concept is really interesting. The phase risk and the magic sort of affecting the Underdark is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. The issue with Out of the Abyss is that the motivation becomes similar to that of Tyranny of Dragons, where it goes, demons are attacking, don't you want to deal with that? And the players are like, no. I mean, no, I just want to leave is what I want to do. Like I, I, I was put here against my will. I don't want to help these people. A lot of the cities in the Underdark are not very redeemable, um, at least to player eyes. Mm -hmm. I actually one time ran it for a bunch of evil characters. And even then it's not fun because yeah. it, it, there's nothing fun for evil characters to do because the, part, the game just expects you to be good. Yeah. And so it, it starts off so promising. And then five sessions in, it gets really boring. Mm -hmm. So that that would just be my I, like. I really like the mechanic that the, the of the drow chasing you down right. through the underdark. Mm -hmm. That's really fun. But I think the prison's also really cool. The prison is cool. Yeah. And Menzel Branson is really cool. Like it's all the, really cool um, in a bottle, but like as a campaign, it, it just doesn't work. 
So, and the Demon Lords are really cool too. Yes. I like the Demon Gorgon. Uh, uh, Zugget Boy's in, in that one a lot. Yeah, she's very cool. So five out of 10. I give it a five out of 10 as well. Look at him. All right, next up is Look Curse of him. Strahd. Specifically Curse of Strahd revamped. Um, they reprinted it mm-hmm. to be better. There's a big nice. list of what they changed in it. And uh, it's great. I love all the changes they made to Curse of Strahd revamped. Curse of Strahd is probably one of the best fifth edition adventures. Um, I know it's not for everybody is the thing. I'm sure people are really tired of hearing of how good Curse of Strahd is, but it's just that Curse of Strahd has created a formula that I think is really, really good. I will go over my cons first. The DM has to often fill in a lot of crucial story blanks, but I'll get to that in my pros. For example, the players can find Rictavio and Rictavio is actually Rudolf Van Richten. Mm -hmm. And if the party figures this out, his quest with the tiger in Velaki is like resolved. It says that he goes to his tower, but then it doesn't detail what happens next because the tower is actually trapped and Esmeralda is using it as sort of like a base, which is where her, her wagon is. So you don't really know what happens when he goes there. Um, another example would be the abbot in St. Markovia. He's constructed a flesh golem lady that he wants to marry off to Strahd because he thinks that that will work. And he wants the party to go get a dress for him. So the party can go get a dress and come back and give him the dress and the game just goes, okay. And, and then you have to figure out what happens mm-hmm. next. I struggle with that as a DM personally, because when I run a pre-written adventure, I want the game to kind of tell me what happens, but this is also a good thing <laughs> because it leaves it open-ended. What happens is sort of up to the DM and to the players. The game doesn't resolve it for you because they want it to be your unique end or climax to that small quest. So while I'm like, oh, I have to figure this out, it's also really good because it can make Curse of Strahd really unique for for your game and your players. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Death House sucks. (laughs) And the intro was a little goofy. I, I think that the starting quest to take Ismark and Irina to Kretsk is just okay. But the rest of it is so good because not only are you in a trap scenario, which is you need to get out of Barovia, which is immediately compelling Mm -hmm. to the players, but it has really good character motivation to be there. You could be anybody and you could be trapped in in Barovia. You don't have to make a dark, gothic, spooky character in order to be trapped in Barovia. Like Mm -hmm. you can can make weird stuff and it makes sense because you're from somewhere else and now you got trapped here. One of my favorite game design things that Curse of Strahd does is it shows and it doesn't tell. When the game wants to tell the players information about Barovia, it doesn't give them like a wall of text. It doesn't give them an NPC who shows up and tells them everything. Often it happens before their eyes. Players feel more immersed in Barovia without having them listen to like a lecture or something like that. Instead, they get to see it happen. And I, yeah, and I love that. The only time you're given a wall of text is if you find the, the Tome of Strahd. But the cool thing is that the players will value a wall of text because they rarely ever get it. Yeah. Instead, people and either don't to, know things. They had to search for it. And they had to look for it. And so it's valuable information for them. Mm-hmm. I think the only thing I would change about Curse of Strahd is I would move the old bone grinder to Kretzk. It'd be on that side of the map. That makes that makes sense. And if you choose the alternate start where they start in Kretzk on that side mm-hmm. of the map, I would keep it where it is. Because yeah. I think if they don't listen to the warnings of the people in the village of Barovia, mm-hmm. they're gonna die. Because every time everyone hears, oh, don't go there, don't go there, as new players, they go, I'm gonna go there, and then someone's gonna die, or you're gonna teach It's the it. only part of Curse of Strahd that's like weirdly unbalanced. It's a very, very difficult mm-hmm. fight. And you are you are hinted to go there numerous times when you are in the village of Barovia. And not only that, but it's like really enticing as players to see a windmill off in the distance and not want to investigate it. Yeah. Curse of Strahd gives players amazing motivation and compels them to live in Barovia and to make active change within it. And when they make change, it's reflected through the story. Mm -hmm. The reason why so many people like Curse of Strahd is because it respects the players. I think all of the NPCs are also really interesting. Yeah, the NPCs are really good. And there's cool magic items. Mm -hmm. Gothic horror is rad. It can still be a little goofy if you make it. It's not all dark. But you could make it dark if you wanted. You could make it darker, you could make it lighter. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah, 10 out of 10. 10, nine out of 10. 10 out of 10. Mm, Nine out of 10. <laughs> Storm King's Thunder. Yeah. Storm King's Thunder is, in my opinion, boring and slow and fails to provide crucial story. Uh, has really crappy starting adventures. The DM has to do almost all the work. It is pretty much just a campaign setting and you need an entirely other book to run it properly. The only things that I remember from playing this were 
character-led moments. I don't remember why we were doing them or who told us to do them. Just yep. that we went and did them and that it was kind of fun because we made it fun. Yes. Uh, um, but I, I've heard a lot of people say to tie it in with Tomb of Annihilation and it makes it better. Um, so that's kind of what I did was I sort of used it as a way to give Tomb, you guys, a little more motivation in Tomb, but we didn't actually run Storm King's Thunder. No, we, we just, just took elements We just took it. tiny pieces of it because this adventure is very strange to me. It's just, like, it starts off pretty good. If you start at level three and the players are in a town and it gets attacked by giants, like, that's immediately pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the tyranny of dragons thing all over again. It's like, don't you want to stop all the giants? And it's like, uh, uh, sort of, I guess. <laughs> yes, but I don't know anything more than that. I don't know anything more than that. So let's go find more information yeah. and then so the players are given the entirety of the sword coast effectively well <laughs> the savage frontier mm -hmm. and it literally has all of these locations that the players can go to in just chapter three which is insane and they didn't put a ton of description into all of those places because they couldn't fit all of it so it's way too big and it just turns into just this really big campaign setting set in the forgotten realms i've never gotten to the end of it maybe the ending is really good mm -hmm. for the most part this is just not what i enjoy out of a DD adventure i want a pretty concise tight narrative that my players can make choices in overall kind of a affect this story and come to a really cool climax. And uh, this is none of that. Yep. So I gave it a, a three out of 10. I gave it a four, just cause it had goofy moments. We, we have a few good memories from yeah. it. Yeah, yes. but it's mostly it. We just kind of made our fun. Tales from the Awning Portal. Tales from the Awning Portal is an anthology adventure book. It comes with seven adventures, if you want to call them that, that are from older editions. I think one of them is from D&D Next, so it's technically fifth edition. They uh, put in this book that are not really interconnected that you can just run whenever you mm -hmm. want to, which is cool. That's a cool concept. I think it makes it very easy to put them into your own game, which is what you did. Yes. All of the ones that I've played in we're in your world somewhere. Yes, and that's the idea behind this, is it's not supposed to be this campaign. It is explore seven deadly dungeons in this adventure supplement. I mean, that's the thing, is that they're dungeon crawls. They're big dungeon crawls, and where they've been updated for fifth edition, but nothing really interesting or cool has been added to make them really compelling. They're just rooms with traps. Yeah, I- And monsters. We did quite a few of them online. And I remember it being fun, but most of the game was slow because we had to figure out traps and then they were fun. I guess if you want to play like a goofy meat grinder, because yeah. that's kind of like how I see this book. It's like, yeah. it's a big goofy meat grinder with no story and, and nothing really to interconnect them. If you just want to sit down and play a board game, as Dungeons and Dragons, then I guess this book would be perfect for you, but <laughs> it's not my thing. I also, it has the Tomb of Horrors in it, and the Tomb of Horrors is dumb. It's on my shirt. Wow, that's cool. I, uh, I don't like dungeon crawls, but... The pros are, it has really cool magic items and really cool monsters. Oh. Yep, Tomb of Annihilation. This one's hard. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, Easily. no, I, en I enjoyed playing in it. Mm -hmm. But I think depending on the DM, the game is very different because mm -hmm. I've played through some of it with Logan and some of it with you. Mm -hmm. And the things that Logan really held on to and ran with, yeah. I didn't enjoy. Okay. Not saying that it was bad overall. It was still fun. It's just when you ran it, we were already a higher level. I guess it was a little bit easier to just run through to yeah so that's actually my criticism of it as well the character hook isn't solid there's little reason to explore chult when you start the game you are told by an npc that a death curse is affecting the entire world and i specifically am dying from it and i want you to go figure it out and so you get dropped off in port yanzaru which is re a really cool city with really cool factions mm -hmm. and dinosaur races and lots of stuff to explore. I really like Port Nanzaru. Mm -hmm. But you're just like, okay, so what do we do now? We're supposed to go stop this death curse for this lady? But that's why when we ran it, I wanted to start it at a higher level so that it didn't feel very meat grindery. And you guys had the ability to know what to do next and to go explore. And that's my favorite part of Tomb of Annihilation. It is genuinely has the most creative ideas for a DD &D adventure. There is so many cool locations and interesting NPCs in this adventure that like that alone should is enough to be like just run it because it's it's real or at least read it because it's great inspiration for your DD yeah. &D games. Um, there are fun NPCs or interesting locations. 
it also has really like good character choice and consequences. Yeah. Like it, the Portia and Zaru could like just be destroyed or could flourish based on what your players do. Cholt is alone just a really good sandbox to go explore. In. It's hard. It's difficult because you have to make sure you're not getting like killed by insects. And also there's a death curse, which is uh, once again, plays into the consequences of this game. If people die, they can't be brought back. And I love that that is like the setting of this adventure is that it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And you're going to have to think really thoroughly about what you do. I think that Omu gets a little slow. Yeah. I think that throughout the entire adventure, you're going through like these really cool dungeon areas that yeah. are all unique. And then when you get to Omu, it's kind of doing the same thing. And it, it's a treasure hunt for puzzle pieces and you have to get the puzzle pieces into a wall. And then if you get into the wall, you get to go into the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Yeah, once you're the in the Tomb of the Nine Gods, I feel like it picks back up again, yes. but going through this really cool jungle and doing all of these things to get to Omu and then Omu is kind of just really, really slow yeah, and yeah, could yeah. take a few yeah. games. The cool part is that if your players finish the adventure, they could likely bring back all the people that were killed throughout the adventure, which is a really, really good uh, resolution to this adventure. The Tomb of the Nine Gods is like the revamp of the Tomb of Horrors, and I, I as a DM, found it very fun to run. It, there's more than just traps. There's NPCs, there's yeah. puzzles, there's secrets, there's lots of stuff to do in there, and things for all types of characters. You can be a barbarian, a rogue, or a warlock, and you'll have fun in the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Or maybe you'll throw corpses off into yeah. the center of the dungeon, have them all fall to the ground, and aggro the gargoyles at the bottom who all come fight you, and, and maybe you TPK. Almost TPK. We, we didn't TPK, but no, we got I really didn't. close. I really like Tomb of Annihilation. It's it's a good time. Yeah. Um, I think it has really creative ideas, and also a Sarek's cool. Yeah. I agree. Cool. 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10 for me as well. Uh, don't aggro the gargoyles. Don't aggro the gargoyles, eight out of 10. Water Deep Dragon Heist, still, even <laughs> comparing to our previous review of all of the adventures before some of these guys had come out down here, mm -hmm. uh, Water Deep Dragon Heist is still my favorite adventure for fifth edition. It is perfect for new DMs and experienced DMs. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna go over my cons first. Your cons. Uh, oh, my notes. The only thing I wish is that you could go through the entirety of the year with all of the villains acting as the villains, at least as an option in case mm -hmm. you wanted to do that. Because the cool part about Waterdeep Dragon Heist is you pick the season that you want to play the game in and you get a different villain and kind of like a different story and you get to customize it to sort of be mm -hmm. your own. And I love that so much because it's so replayable and you could even take elements from the other seasons and run two villains if you wanted to, mm -hmm. which is really fun. But uh, the pros I gave it is that not only it's easy to run for new DMs, um, it's, it's, it starts off with a pretty simple dungeon crawl that isn't too difficult for new DMs and new players to run and figure out, and a mystery, which is immediately very compelling because of uh, this takes place in urban adventure, mm -hmm. and I think that that's such a good introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. Like, you guys are just some dudes, we're gonna go try to find another guy, and you end up finding this like secret plot that relates to all the other villains later down the line. I think it does this really good mix of being that sort of D and D goofiness, while also being really, really serious and having the the ability to be dark, compelling, and even like really sad too at some points in time. Like this adventure just has really good writing, in my opinion. Like the the characters are really interesting, and the villains are very, very complex and nuanced. And sometimes your players don't always make the right decisions, and sometimes they have to choose and. The cool part is that because you're never higher than like level five in this adventure, your players are often thinking as people and not as crazy overpowered gods who can summon meteors. It's it's these down to earth humanizing choices that your players make in this game. And the consequences are real and the story is very real. And it's really good. That's all I'm gonna say. It's just, this is a really good. I think that it could be very confusing at times. Yeah. I think that's my only con for this list. So, How so? Um, I th just, I think that there's like the, the three things you need to like collect to get into the vault was confusing. And then the bit after the fireball, I know we kind of struggled with like what's going on yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you don't, if the breadcrumbs aren't laid in the right way, it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to follow them. The thing is that you have to communicate to your players that this adventure eventually becomes a treasure hunt 
where yeah. you are taking this stone that is effectively a key and you're trying to keep it away from the bad guys while you try to go find it yourself. Yeah, just everything to do with the fireball we struggled with. We didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was just we were also playing three other games at the same time <laughs> and it was just really jumbled together mm -hmm. or... Yeah, I've run it for different parties, and I've had some parties figure out the fireball pretty easily. I've had some people really struggle with it, not know where to go, and be like, what, what do we do here? And you kind of have to feed them a little bit of information at first. But luckily, with the fireball section, the game does a really good job at being like, okay, if your party is struggling, here's like three NPCs that kind of just tell them where to go, what they do. They're just witnesses to what they saw and they can sort of figure right. it out from there. It also has one of my favorite things that is in some of the other DD adventures, which is a rival adventurers. Um, what are they called? Yeah. The Doom Patrol? The Doom Squad? The, Something like that. The, I think the, it's, tomb, the Tomb Squad? I don't squad. think it's Doom Patrol. That's that's Gerard Way. <laughs> the Dungeon? They're not the Dungeon Dudes. The dungeon, <laughs> it's the Dungeon Dudes. That's it. They're so cool. The Doom Raiders. The Doom Raiders. Um, they're, they're a group of five dudes who are like a rivaling adventuring party. And there's more ways that you could incorporate them. It does incorporate them a little bit into the story, but yeah. they have so much potential. I think it'd be really fun to run Waterdeep Dragon Heist and maybe they are also trying to get the Stone of Galore mm -hmm. and you have to keep it not only out of the villain's hands, but their hands as well. But maybe they want it for the same reason the party does, but they yeah. want all the glory for it. So I, I, I just, I love that. I think it just has so many really interesting ideas. And uh, another tiny thing that I think is really cool that they did with this book is that you could play this game with dice, paper, and a pencil, and you could still run it. But you could also run this game on like Roll20 or like a TV table with like Beetle and Grimms and stuff, and it would still be good on both sides. Yeah. This adventure lets the DM run the game however they want to do it. For that, I give it a 9 out of 10. I think that this book also has uh, two of the best villains in it. The Castle Lanterns? I love the Castle Lanterns. Not, I, the Castle Lanterns are very good. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that Jarlaxle, Xanathar, and Manchun are also I'm very good. I'm sure they good. are. I've never, I've never uh, I don't look through the books just in case we ever play them again. And I've heard great things, but we ran through the Gen Castle Lanterns. Genuinely the best villains in any D&D &D Yes, game. more than Strahd. Easily. Easily. I, I love them a lot. Yep. Um, I gave it 9 out of 10. Co <laughs> coinciding with Waterdeep Dragon Heist, in case you hit level 5 and you've done an urban mystery campaign that had lots of serious themes and choices, how about you delve down into the Yawning Portal and do a dungeon crawl where you're not going to do any of that anymore. <laughs> And you're just gonna hate yourself. Uh, I honestly haven't played this. I've read through it. I, I think we ran We've one game. We started in it, it and like twice. It, it's like again. I know there are some people who are gonna be like, I love this book. It's mm -hmm. super fun. But we just don't. This just isn't our D and D cup of tea. Um, this is I don't a like dungeon crawls. Two, this is like a 320 page uh, dungeon that has a lot of really cool themes in it, and it's really interesting and super neat. But why does this happen after Dragon Heist? Why did they relate these two? These these are very different. <laughs> I have not played enough of it to give it a rating. So, yeah. um, but I, I, I don't really want to run it because I it's just it not I gave it a thing. three out of 10. Um, we did like a little lead up thing to that, and then the second we got down into the dungeon, I was like, this isn't fun anymore. Because mm -hmm. um, it's just like do a dungeon. Like that's the whole yeah. point of the game is you want to do a dungeon? No, I don't. <laughs> I'll do uh, half of a game in a dungeon. Yeah. And yeah. then the next game, I'd like to not be in the dungeon anymore. Speaking of dungeon crawls, Ghosts of Salt Marsh. <sighs> so if you looked at Ghosts of Salt Marsh and were like, oh my god, a seafaring camp? I I've done a whole video about Ghosts of yeah. Salt Marsh. I was in the bath and I talked about what I didn't like about this. But to quickly go over again Ghosts of Salt Marsh and sort of our opinions of it and to review it purely just as an adventure. This is not a seafaring adventure. No. This is the yawning portal, but they set it in a small town called Salt Marsh where all the adventures are sort of interconnected, where you are trying to save Salt Marsh from a bunch of Sahuigan. And we've said over and over again that this book isn't seafaring, it's underwater adventures is yeah. what it is. It's diving and swim mechanics, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a lot of dungeon crawls. I never knew where we were going or what we were doing when we played this game. Because the motivation is all over the place. Yeah. You're, you're like called by the Salt Marsh Council to go stop some smugglers, and then it's all this secret conspiracy of like, Sahuigan who are trying to destroy Saltmarsh, so you gotta go stop them. And the final enemy, which is the sixth chapter of this eight chapter book, is the end to that storyline. You destroy the Sahuigan and you're done. Tamarot's fate 
and the styes are not connected to Saltmarsh. They take place on completely different areas of the world, and I decided to run Ghost of Saltmarsh within like the Forgotten Realms. It was weird because like you guys were here for the entirety of the game, and then like for the styes and for uh, Tamarat's fate, you had to go like to Cormir all the way over here. It was, it was dumb, and I wanted to run them all together, so. It's weird that they are connected for like those first five and then they're not. Yeah. I, I really wanted you to be able to use the ship mechanics they provided in the game and they just they just don't do that. And overall, the adventures are not very compelling. They're kind of boring and a lot of them are dungeon crawls and they don't have super interesting NPCs. And it's just, it's just mid. Like this is the most mid adventure book that they've made. I would say the only thing I do like about it is if you ignore the fact that it was supposed to be a seafaring book, Tamarot's Fate and Salvage Operation are really good standalone adventures that you could put into like your homebrew campaign, especially if you're running like a Sea of Thieves open world seafaring game. One of them you're like exploring an old forgotten ship and it gets attacked by a kraken at the end the players have to escape. That one's really cool. Tamarot's Fate is cool because there's this part where the party has to survive on an island while zombies are attacking. Yeah, it. that, that adventure that one, was fun. That one was really mm -hmm. fun. So, but the rest of them, I mean, don't go in the back door of a lizard folk cave, they otherwise they'll you. kill you. Yeah, I think that what we thought it was was nothing that it was. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it was the marketing or we just misunderstood what it was going to be, but I know like... We had a player leave the leave the game because it wasn't what they thought it was going to be, nope. and I, I don't disagree with them. I mm. think that that's true. Yep. I think we made it fun, and... I mean, that was my fault. I should have just read the book before I ran it. Like, that could have been solved in a session zero. Yeah. Well, 5 out of 10. I'm going to also give it a 5 out of 10. Dragon of Ice Dragon Peak. of Ice Fire Peak. I have not run this. I have not played in it. You... I did run it. I have, I have nothing on this. This is all you. I think you could run this for any person. Really? And it would be fun. Why? Because it's great. It's great for starting DMs, and it's not very complicated, so you could run it for children. I cool. ran it for a group of six to sixth graders to like eighth grade range. Mm -hmm. I think you could run it for lower, uh, maybe change a few things if you don't want it to be too spooky. 20 bucks a target. You get dice, you get character yep. sheets. You get like little flashcards for like initiative. That's cool. It's like a really great starting If you starting are adventure. interested in playing D&D &D and you want to play like an officially published adventure, Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, this is like the perfect one you can yeah. get. It's easily accessible. It's very easy to run. And you can tie it into any of the other Forgotten Realms adventures or your own adventure if now that you've played something, mm -hmm. you're comfortable running something a little more complicated. Yep. Yep. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Sort of like the Quest of Nomicon. Oh, you can't plug your own book in this. It's kind of like, like the D&D nope. adventures nope. are not good nope. at making first to third level adventures. And it'd be cool if there was like a book filled with first to third level adventures that you could start your campaigns in with any sort of theme with customizable villains. There's already a sponsor on this video. Yeah. Shit, you're right. All right. <laughs> Descent into Avernus. This is where we're going to disagree because I love this book. I just hate the Baldur's Gate part. Yep, okay. right, I've talked about okay. this book on, I, on this channel too. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard you. You've gone through. You've ranted several times about this book. Of course. I've played maybe the first two chapters of this book twice from what you've told me and explained because you ran this for a group of other people that, mm -hmm. and I didn't play in it. You played all the way through. You had always had a really great things to say. I think from what you've explained you would do now. Yeah, there's, there's your lady. She's I the know. best villain. I know. From what you explained that you would do now, where you would run either a revised dragon heist mm -hmm. leading into this, or you would just start an El Torel, mm -hmm. I think I would enjoy it a lot more than the slog that is Baldur's Gate. Yeah, the Baldur's Gate beginning opening is, is way too hard, sloggy, and feels tacked on at the last second, and barely plays into the rest of the adventure. Mm -hmm. it is, I don't know why they put it in this book. I think it was a marketing thing that, that, that they did. But I think that this adventure is personally my favorite when it comes to concepts and design. This book has so many fun locations. It has lots of choices. There is a dungeon in this book that is like, it's not top down, it's sideways. It's 2D. Later in the adventure, there's a dream sequence where you learn Zeriel's backstory, not from somebody telling you, but because your characters live through it. There's Mad Max vehicle fighting that you actually get to use, Ghosts of Saltmarsh. You actually get to use the vehicles right. in, in this book. You can go to the river sticks and there's like these bone devils who are like, hey, you wanna help us scrape souls off the bottom of the sticks? We'll pay you for it. And it's like, this is fun game that you get to do where you get to go 
deep sea diving in the in the, in the river sticks. And so I just feel like they they really popped off with the Avernus section of this book. It's it's very fun. Even if you don't want to run that portion of the adventure, it has lots of really cool ideas that you could use for your campaigns. So and also you can redeem Zeriel, which is one of my favorite character things ever is a villain that can be redeemed. Um, and you also don't have to redeem her. You can kick her ass, and that's fine too. And I love that. So it gets an 8 out of 10. I gave it a 5. Damn. Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Beautiful. Oh my god. I've been surprised by this book. We haven't finished it yet. No, he's Because not. it's enormous. Yes. But if you want to watch us play it, we're playing it on every other Saturday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it's really surprised me. I thought it wasn't going to be that good, and it is very, very good. My favorite game that I'm playing in right now. Yeah. I, I didn't... I, I thought the opening was too over the top, and there was way too many quests. After we started playing it, I started to realize how great the game design is, that you can start in any of the ten towns of your choice mm -hmm. and pick the starting quest that your players go on in this book, and then you open up the rest of the world. Yeah, I think that this game has a lot going on, but but still manages to be like very cohesive. Like everything connects to each other very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of the 10 towns are very unique and I just love every mm -hmm. bit of it. Icewind Dale for the most part is this adventure where the entirety of the 10 towns and the, the Icewind Dale is just cursed in perpetual darkness. Called It's called the Everlasting Rhyme. Mm -hmm. And it's because Oral, the, the god of winter, maiden. I just went, I want it to be cold now, and it's dark, and it's cold, and I don't care, I'm a god. Mm -hmm. And she's a really good villain. She's different than all the other villains. She's not like Zeriel, where she can be redeemed. She's not like Strahd, where she's ever-present. Instead, she's this mystical, distant being that embodies winter, and that is really, really interesting. The only thing I would change about this book is I think that Sunblight is too hard for the level that you're supposed to do it. Agreed. Sunblight to me is the weakest part of this adventure. Eventually you, your players, once they get to about to like third to fifth level, mm -hmm. they are motivated to go to this Duragar fortress called Sunblight, where the Duragar are building a giant metal dragon that is going to destroy the 10 towns so they can take it over. And I love that this adventure goes, okay, we're gonna give you 10 possible starting quests. You can't do all of them. You can do a few of them. And then a dragon is going to show up and destroy a bunch of the 10 towns, rendering some of those quests gone. You can never do them. Maybe the party kills the Chartland dragon before it attacks, or maybe they don't and all the 10 towns are destroyed. The Chartland dragon aspect of Sunblight is one of the coolest things they've done in a recent adventure, and I love, love it. But Sunblight, the fortress filled with a million Duragar that you're supposed to do at like level four is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of motivation to go there because they don't even know about the Chartland Dragon unless they force it out on one of the Durgar that they find out. So it's more just, I'm just going here for curiosity. Oh no, there's a dragon leaving. I think the coolest part is um, the last chapter, um, which you don't know about yet, but I'll just go over my notes here. My cons, same as Salt Marsh, not really advertised as what it was. It was advertised as something else. This is not really a horror book. It gets, there's some things in it that are horror themed, yeah. but it's really goofy. Some of the most interesting locations are in mm -hmm. here. A lot of the locations have really, really good game design. One of my favorite, I don't want to spoil it for in case anybody's going to play it, but the Black Cabin is one of my favorite things in any D&D book. It is so cool just because of its game design. Yeah. It is very, very interesting. And the Lost Spire of Netheril. The fact that it's like upside down and like in the snow, that's so, so cool, really interesting. I really like that a lot of the opening quests are challenging because it forces low level players to use their brains and not rely on their abilities. Sometimes you can just complete some of these quests without killing everything. There's ways that you can think about how to, to, um, to solve your situations in this game. And I really like that. This is this is one of the few books that does levels one through three really well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I give this one a nine out of 10. I also give it a nine out of 10. We'll see when we finish it though. Maybe I'll feel differently about when we finish it, but so far, I really like Icewind Dale. And next up is Candlekeep Mysteries. I have oh, not oh. run um, all of this book. No. I have run a little bit of this book. I've run two adventures out of it and I've read uh, about half of them. I really like Candlekeep Mysteries. It has really interesting, really cool mysteries for D&D games, which I think are a really hard thing to pull off for D&D. Yep. Mysteries require a lot of breadcrumbs and you have to help your players out a lot. And this book does a really good job at 
letting players figure it out themselves. There's not just one way that they have to do it, you know, and if there is one way they have to do it, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, and the players get to feel really good about figuring it out. Well, you got to play in the first adventure, Fistandia's Mansion, yep. and um, I thought it was really clever and really interesting. The players are trapped in a magnificent, ma magnificent mansion. mansion, they have to find a way out, mm -hmm. and it's very compelling, great story hook, yeah. and also all the adventures are kind of interconnected, which I think is fun. And I think mysteries yeah. are the hardest thing to do in a D&D &D game, mm -hmm. and they do them very well. So if you're wanting to add a mystery into your game, you're not very really confident, I think you could go through, because there's how many in here? Quite, uh, there's quite a few I in there. there's 15. And you could find one that would fit your game, maybe two or three that would fit your game, and just sprinkle them throughout. And yeah. You could just take one if you wanted to, because yeah. there's one for all every level up to 15. Oh. And um, you could take one, or you could run the entire book as a campaign, which yeah. is why it's very cool. It's not just one writer writing every single one. They have a lot of different people who wrote in this book, and it keeps it very fresh and very interesting, and you get a lot of really cool concepts and themes with all of the mysteries. Mm -hmm. So I give it an 8 out of 10. I gave it a 6 out of 10, but only because I didn't play very many of them. Yeah. So. Well, Beyond the Witchlight! Haven't played in it. But we will. But we will. And then I'll let you know how yep. I feel about it. <laughs> Strixhaven, Curriculum of Chaos, haven't really played in it. I, I We didn't run the, the pre-written adventure that's in Strixhaven. I took elements of it and we did a two shot within Strixhaven and I, and I kind of customized it to be my own thing. And we had a lot of fun with it. I also, I made like a 20 minute video talking about why I like this book. So if you want to go see everything that I feel about Strixhaven, go watch my Strixhaven is better than you think video because I freaking love Strixhaven. I like how it's designed. I, I like the world building a lot. I love the one shots that we did and the entire group that we played with is really excited for when we actually play this as a campaign. Yeah, we're going to run it on our Arcane. Arcane um, I also point. love that all of the, uh, NPCs that you can become friends or enemies with mm -hmm. in this book. I love that as a concept for the book. Yeah. Also, all of them are magic cards. <laughs> and it was fun going through our strict saving stuff and being like, oh, she's... That's the character. She's in this book. I like that uh, becoming friends or enemies with people has consequences mm -hmm. or, and like uh, rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all really... Cool. This book has a focus on slice of life. Mm -hmm. with too many too with, many source books are focused on the grand lore of the world. And this book focuses on the people you interact with, yeah. the classes that you go to, and your day-to-day -day routine yeah. and how that becomes your adventure. And that's really cool. Seven out of 10. Uh, I give it an eight out of 10 just because I like it so much. Critical Role, Call of the Netherdeep. Whoa. Haven't played it. Neither have I. Haven't ran it. R it just came out. It's Red, very, Red very pretty. Red through it a little bit. It's very pretty. Yeah. Seems neat. I like that they took the rival mechanic that I talked about within uh, Dragon Heist and made it a pretty big portion of this game. I think having an ad a rival adventuring party is really fun and a cool concept, mm -hmm. but I cannot say anything about this book because I, I really don't know what what it what it is yeah. so i'm not gonna write it yeah well geez that's all the freaking D, &D pre-written adventures yeah if only there was like a book that had really good first to third level adventures that could lead into some of them or maybe just as one shots in case you didn't want to move into some of the campaigns some kind that could be of any theme. Um, if only. Yeah, if only. If only that existed. All um, right. Well, thanks everybody for listening to us talk about D&D books for this long. Well, the last time we did this was a little while ago and it's kind of fun to refresh yeah. these. I wonder if some of our opinions change. I don't know. Maybe they're all the same I still. I think uh, Curse of Strahd still up here and that's all that matters. Waterdeep Dragon Heist is better than Curse of Strahd. It's not. Oh my goodness, yes it is. No. Yes it is. I think this is how we ended the last video. No, they, I'm sure that we've had different opinions and our minds have grown and we've matured as we've gotten older. Curse of Strahd is still the best. It's not. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. Descended Avernus is actually probably better than Curse of Strahd. That. Maybe they're about the same. Maybe, maybe Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, but... Haven't finished it we yet. We can agree on where I'm the Frostman and being uh, S tier. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. But you know what's S plus? Shut up. Just shut up. Just shut up. I'm, no. Uh, watch. You can, no more Curse of Strahd right. uh, being talked about in this video. Well. Yeah. I'm yeah. pushing the end button. What are you going to do about it? that? I'm, I'm going to just keep telling you about Curse of Strahd after the video ends. Name one thing in Curse of Strahd that's better than Dragon Heist. Oh, let's see. Top 10 things that are better in Curse of Strahd than... Did you, did you end the video? 
So I want, what's your answer? What's my answer? Yeah. You can't put me on the spot like this. I can. Okay. It's because there is none. Well, because it's because I'm right. No. Uh, the villains in Waterdeep Dragon Heist are better. Uh, okay. The mystery Cast is better. Are better than no. Strahd, but that doesn't yes, mean that overall. That is true. Uh, that there's overall, better rewards no. at the end. Um, the boss fights are. You cooler. will get an entire um, castle if you play your cards right. Well, it seems a little more complicated than Waterdeep Dragon Heist. You are. You are. You. Are, you get a manor in Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, a castle's better than a manor. You're saving an entire... Volo's in Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Mordenkainen is in... Uh... Yeah, but he's a bitch in it. Well, he's, he, a, he's stupid. He, he's like, I'm a deer and, and I don't want to do anything. Volo, he, he's like, give me money. Yeah, to find his best friend. Who's probably his he lover. Doesn't, that's true. Stroud's gay. A little bit. Yep. Yeah. Mm. This is difficult. Stroud, this is better. There's a... There's... There's so much. There's so much. Dragon Heist is a is a better story. No, it's not. It just is. It's not. It is. You are you are saving an entire. At least uh, at least none of the villains in Dragon Heist are simp's. What are you talking about? Wh what? Yeah, none of, the, no, none of the villains in Dragon Heist are simp's. Strahd is. So. I I I told you already. Castlanters are better. Villain than yeah, Strahd. Yeah, so but it's But overall, better. Curse of Strahd is a better book. It's sad. It's sad all the time. Dragon Heist is run a the castle lanterns, has a multitude. Run the Castle Landers and you will be a depressed. Multitude. Uh, that's true. That's true, but I will just be depressed at the end. And I'll have to make a mm -hmm. difficult choice. You don't have to kill kids. You don't have to kill kids in Curse of Strahd. That, y yeah, you don't have if to anything, kill kids in you can Dragon Heist. save more children in Curse of Strahd than you can in Waterdeep. That's what you're rating Curse of Strahd yep. by? It? Curse of Strahd is better Do because you can save children? more children? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's rank all the adventures based on how many children you get to save. Curse <laughs> Number one, of, Curse, of, Curse Strahd. of Strahd. Number two, Rhyme of the Frostmaiden, those incest kids. Number three. <laughs> okay, we're going.